whenever I'm privileged to be here, I'm always aware of the fact that it is a privilege. I said to my wife as we drove along yesterday, I came to this place at 17 years of age, and I don't know why I love Oakwood so much, but I do. It's both a privilege and an experience to be introduced by Elder Bradford, a good friend over many years. And when we look back 40 years of breath of life history, I am considered at the beginning of the period. And I'll be very honest with you, I appreciate my brethren whom I've had the privilege of working with, and especially do I appreciate the generosity and the kindness of Elder Bird, Dr. Bird. It means a lot to me. And he involved us in this, and this weekend. And I thank God for the opportunity. Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we simply ask that you would bless this little period we have together with thy presence. And we ask it in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. I was reading a bit the other day, and I saw two words combined. And I had never seen this combination before. Instead of gross darkness, it read deep darkness. And that caught my attention. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the design of the devil himself to enshroud this entire world in darkness. Oh, what is darkness? The dictionary said simply, it is the absence of light, or at least a deficiency of light. But then there are other definitions. One is simply evil. That's darkness. Confusion, and I wish you'd put a pin in that one. That's what turns us into Babylon. Confusion. And darkness more and more is prevailing in our time. Darkness. One writer speaks of a dominion of darkness. Vast realms where the light of God's word is unknown and unheard. A dominion of darkness with Satan as its reigning prince. As a matter of fact, the plan of redemption was devised to counter this darkness that is constantly advancing upon the world. A battleground declared Lines were drawn, and in a great council assembled at nowhere, God spoke to nothing and said, let there be something. And there was light. You see, dear ones, there had developed in God's once lovely world a problem that cannot be calculated by the human mind. A rapidly distrengthening darkness opposed forever to the Prince of Light. As a matter of fact, the Bible says Jesus is the light. Yes, sir. It just popped into my head. There is a compound word in the Bible, but you don't read it in English that way. You read the name of the Prince of Darkness, Lucifer. 
That comes from a compound word, lux, which means light, and fero, which means to carry. Lucifer means light bearer. And that was the responsibility of him before he was kicked out of heaven. I, I want to dramatize a little bit something that is a reality in my history. I was a country boy, born on a farm. They had some country schools, but the whole area where our farm was, we were bused to city schools, which meant our friends, our classmates, all came from the city, as did the parties and the basketball and the football and many other things that we developed a real love for, we were attached to the city and not to the country. A bus picked us up at 6.30 every morning and got us home at 6.30 in the evening. And here is what I want you to get. The last bus, city bus, the last bus home left the city square at 11 p.m. Now you had a choice, you could be on board or you could face uncertain times. And so I often had to catch that last bus home. It carried me to a suburb called Fairfield. And then you had three blocks, three blocks of city lights, three blocks of sidewalk. And when you stepped off the sidewalk after those three blocks, you were confronted by total darkness and you felt all alone. It seemed that the end of the world had come upon you at a time like that. Now the last bus home was your last opportunity to go that far. After that, as I said, you were all alone on a dark country road with a forest on either side and cars passing so seldom you might walk that mile and a half without encountering even the headlights of an automobile. Now, when you're 15 and 16, that is a test, a problem for a nervous teenager. And I might as well tell you, as you walked along, there were many strange sounds to hear. You didn't hear them in the daytime. But these were nocturnal animals. I started to say possum, that sounds so southern. The old possum. Owls hooting around. And when you heard these sounds, and I should include the raccoons, when you heard these sounds, if you listen carefully, you could hear dog packs in the distance. This is when people couldn't afford to take care of animals and they brought them out to this vast forest and simply turned them loose. And they joined together in packs, ran together, hunted together. They never seemed to be close to the little road that I had to take home. And so, dear ones, the main problem for me at 15 years was darkness, darkness. I thought about it many a time. If you yelled because you were in trouble, nobody could hear you. Not in the country that I lived in. And the biggest problem after darkness was imagination. The Bible speaks of the Egyptian darkness, you know. Bible scholars say it was palpable. In other words, darkness so thick you could feel it. Sometimes it felt like Egyptian darkness, especially if there was a slight drizzle. Darkness. 
I don't want you to love it. I want you to think about something. For Satan wishes now to enshroud the entire world with darkness. He wants us confused. And the thing that bothers me, and I guess directed me to these words, is the fact that there was a time we didn't have that kind of darkness in our church. God gave us a message, and that message is sure. You know, there's nothing complicated about truth. Complication sets in when you don't want to do it. And so we got all these questions now. We don't know what we're supposed to do. We don't, oh, I don't see it. And confusion. Faith overcomes confusion. We hear the word of God. We believe the word of God. And so we go back to the idea of God hovering over a vast blackness of nothingness and thundering against the darkness, let there be light, and there was light. And the rest of God's agenda for that week performed in the light. In Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 7, I found a phrase that was strange to me. It says, light is sweet. Roll that around for a moment in your brain. Light is sweet. I want to warn you, the Bible speaks of your understanding being darkened. The truths God has made clear and that you once loved and obeyed can become more and more obscure and can be turned to darkness where rather than praising you complain and find fault, and can't understand? What is it you don't understand? I found a phrase in the Bible. Jesus had spoken at the Last Supper. The circle was closing, being darkened, according to Ephesians 4. The understanding being darkened. If you persist and insist on darkness, something will happen to you as indicated in this story. Judas was there in attendance at the Last Supper. The circle, the trap is closing about him. The pretender sat amongst the disciples and he pretended to be a believer even at that last hour. A thousand jangles were clanging in his head. Jesus then spoke again, one of you will betray me. What? It was such a shock. The whole room was stunned, and one by one, the disciples began to ask, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And they got around the circle to Judas, and he came out with a feeble question, Lord, is it I? <laughs> but the word was, he went out. Judas left the group. He went out, and it was night. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always night when you go out from the presence of the Holy Spirit, of the Father and the Son. It's always night. And when we understand that word, there's hardly anything more horrible than to contemplate eternal night, eternal night. Imagine a former brother or sister in the church and the doors of mercy are still ajar. And you're trying to get through a prayer for clarity, but you're overcome by desire for darkness. Try to imagine that. The doors of mercy, therefore, are clanging shut forever. And there comes a time when you have to admit it appears to us he is gone. It's over for him. And the epitaph on Judas's grave is recorded in Scripture. Better he had never been born. I want to say this to all of us, and I'm including myself. 
You know, I've always been a simple preacher, and, and uh, it's because I don't look for these high-flown, polysyllabic words to describe our condition. They're simple. And God's will is simple. The most wretched man in hell will not be Adolf Hitler. The most wretched man in hell, or woman, will not be one like Joe Stalin or some of these more modern devils. The most wretched person in hell will be a former Seventh-day Adventist, a graduate from Oakwood University. <laughs> Judas went out, and it was night and Jesus' heart went out after him. But it was now too late. He was one of those who insisted on fun. Everything's got to be fun. No matter how transparently evil a thing is, oh, well, it was fun. But it will not be fun when we are forever separated from one group or the other by jasper walls. Now, Jasper walls were transparent. I have on eyeglasses that help me a bit because the lenses are transparent. Then that's translucent. You can take a sheet of paper and hold it up and see the light shining through. The walls around the city were of transparent Jasper. Now God's people have been in heaven for a millennium. Somebody said to me one day, Pastor, how is Jesus going to fulfill a promise he has sent us that he will take us each for a walk beside the crystal stream and there explain to us all the dark providences through which he led us in to perfect our character? My answer came quickly, we'll have plenty of time. <laughs> I found this in the spirit of prophecy. Jim hadn't seen it before. It says, in the kingdom of God, we will neither require nor desire repose. No wonder there's no night there. We don't need it. We're not even going to get sleepy in heaven. Got to work for the, wait for the new earth in order to get back into that again. But ladies and gentlemen, there is this culture of darkness. And symbolizing it is the night club. The night club. Have you ever heard? <laughs> the night club. 30 a.m. And there comes this text that you're familiar with. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. A night club is a place without angels though a place with demons are plenty. And demons literally can come into a room and touch and caress and manipulate it and put a plug on moral powers and weaken and destroy the restraints. Then a touch of alcohol, don't get drunk, just a touch of alcohol, and soon there will be drugs, and the conscience pulls back but has no strength. And there comes this idea to the lost soul, there is no place on earth like this. So I turned in my dictionary to darkness and read some others. Murky. You know there's a light there, but you can't figure anything out. Murky, thick. And then this word again, deep. I was arrested by it. Deep darkness. Deep. And all other relationships become secondary. Children's bread is cast to the dogs. And awesome truths that once meant so much to us are uninteresting anymore. 
we don't enjoy those things anymore and we seek for a reason and we want to find fault in the church or with the leaders or with the pastor or with somebody when what is happening to us is this spiritual declension that sinks us deeper and deeper into the mire of sin and death. Deep darkness. And the sight is gone. And the Bible says, sadly, we cannot see. We cannot see. I started out in evangelism doing the best I knew and trying to learn. And I was bothered by something. You're going to baptize 50 people, 25 of them believe and are ready and they love God and all the rest of it. And then there's some over here that say to me, I can't see it. I've actually turned my Bible around like this and point my finger and read it. Yeah, but I can't see it. And one day I was in a huge campaign by the grace of God and there were two men came down to see me at the same time. And one came with that excuse, I can't see. It. Well, yeah, you, 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 yes, you did clear, but I can't see it. And the other fellow was rejoicing. He saw it. So I concluded the problem wasn't me. <laughs> I wasn't his problem. He said he couldn't see, and I learned that he couldn't. Now you got to try a new approach to win him, and he's worth it. Yes. He's worth it. I baptized folks that I didn't think would ever really change. And I saw Brother Williams in Greensboro become sober. And the last memory I had of him, he was a deacon in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There was another man there who couldn't read his name on the side of a barn. And on Sabbath, he didn't have a home, so he would get a sandwich or two from somebody. And if he saw a child running around church, he said, come here, son. And he'd turn his Bible around and say, read that to me. And the child would read. And this man would thank the child and send him away. And I wondered, what good is this doing? And he got baptized into this church. And the last time I visited him, he had his own television shop. Now I want to tell you, this was in the days of bulbs you put in, and you had manuals this thick, and you had to read it because it was technical stuff. And he was the only employee in his own shop, but he read that thing, and he repaired television sets. I couldn't do it, and I know how to read. this transforming power of the Word of God. And there are people who cannot see. Don't throw them away. Be patient. Give them time. Give them energy. And give them effort. And the greatest thing of all is know that you yourself are saved. The gospel that saves others must first have saved the one who delivers it. You've got to do it. So God now was in session with the prophet Daniel. God is revealing future truths to Daniel. Time prophecies, awesome truths about the sanctuary and its meaning. And then God stopped. And God said, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words. Seal the book. This isn't for your day. We got thousands of years in the future before these things pertain. So just close the book, Daniel, and seal it till the time of the end. The success of these things depends upon the Messiah, his life, his purpose, his perfection. And so there's no need giving it all to you. It doesn't pertain to you. It pertains to a future. But before we get there, there will be over a thousand years of men teaching lies for truth. And the church that bears my son's name will hear lies that seem reasonable. 
but they are not the truth. And then they will turn against those who believe and destroy them by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands. And then there shall be reprieve, for the Protestant Reformation shall fit in. And men will say scriptures only. And once we have delivered them to this, they will not let go of the mark of the beast. And so, Daniel, an unborn prophet I will raise up. His name will be called John. And he will write about the things concerning my remnant people. And the seals will be broken by the victorious Son of God. But before you write it off, John, uh, Daniel, I'm sorry, before you write these things off, I want you to consider this and put it in there for men and women to read. There will be a time of trouble. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we could stop right there. But I want you to see how the prophet drags this out because that's the way God gave it to him. There will be a time of trouble. That's enough. But then it says, such as never was. And you mean that's not it? No. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Well, Lord, that's clear. Can I stop now? No. There will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. But if my people will love the light, if my people will walk in the light, thousands will die for their faith. But other thousands will bear the truth banner to the very end of days. There's coming a time of trouble and it's almost here. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, write this, a time of trouble. And at that same time, if the lamb endures, at that same time, if the lamb is effective, I, I like to think these thoughts because we are always questioned along these lines. A lady called me the other day, she said, Pastor Brooks, do you really think we can carry this, we can do it, we can be obedient, and we can be saved. Yes, I answered immediately. Well, why do you feel so sure? I said, I'm really not that sure. If we will follow Jesus and he doesn't drop dead, we can make it. And I'm willing to take his word. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead, but behold, I am alive now forevermore. Write it down and don't ever discard it. Believe it. The close of probation will come before that. In the time of the end, I will call forth a remnant church. In the time of the end, I will say something that will be peculiar to them. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon. Verse 9 tells you who that is. The dragon was raw, angry with the church. Uh, he makes me sick in this church with a perfect message we have allowed division to come Malachi said when the days come and the Holy Spirit comes forerunning the actual appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ Malachi said in that day the hearts of the fathers will be drawn to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers but we are allowing division. If you got gray hair, you're an old conservative, say that. But if you're young, you're one of us, an idealist. And somehow we're smarter than that group and vice versa. No, I don't buy any of it. God's church will be one. Now I'm going to quote Ellen White and I want you to mark it down not necessarily with pens and paper, but in your mind. Ellen White says thousands will leave the church and join the enemy. And I'm so grateful she didn't stop there. She said other thousands will come in to take their place. 
and the ranks of the Lord's army shall not be diminished. That's what she says, and that's what I believe. The dragon, therefore, is wroth with the woman, yes, sir. angry with the church. Well, what about them bothers him so? They keep the commandments of God. Yes. In spite of all the things you hear, in spite of the popularity of the current bishop, in spite of these things, they keep the commandments of God. Well, what makes them different there? They keep 10 and not nine. Well, okay, is that it? Is that it? No, that's not it. They also have the testimony of Jesus. Well, what in the world is that? That's what it says in Revelation 19.10. It is the spirit of prophecy. What's that for? Ellen White says it is to guide us through the time of trouble. Now, if you think you don't need any guidance, you wait until darkness covers the earth and deep darkness the people. When you can't think straight and the council is all twisted up and you don't know who to believe or whom, it's coming, folks. The dragon will be angry. But God says once and for all, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I am the light of the world said Jesus. Why so long not willing that any should perish? That's why I've delayed my coming. There are men and women out in the ghettos of America right now who, given half the privilege you and I have had, would be faithful servants of the living God. And I have seen men transformed by the Holy Spirit. There are men that I go into town after town and run into, and I tell them, you are one of my favorite miracles. I didn't even have any confidence in you. But who am I? I, I love to tell stories. There was a woman in one of the efforts, big efforts, that God gave us. She came every night, dignified lady. She came every night, sort of quiet, and would leave. Finally, we got down to decision time. And she came to see me. She said, Pastor, I want to do this. I want to be baptized. But I don't know, I don't even know if God will save me. I said, well, why do you say that? She said, there's something in my life. What is it? He is the great extractor. He can help us. What is it? And then she pulled herself up and looked right into my eyes. Yes, sir. And she said, Pastor, I am a prostitute. And I don't know why God gives you answers like that. But as soon as she looked in my eyes and said it, I said, why, Sister Jesus had one of those in his family tree. <laughs> And just in case you misunderstand, the Bible says Rahab the harlot. She pulled herself together and took courage. We baptized her. Five years later, I'm out in L.A., and there's a meeting of workers, and I'm addressing them, and I see this lady looking. You know, when people are staring at you, you get sort of a, an idea that they are, so you look off and try not to look back. And then I saw this lady almost running down the aisle. When she got to me, she threw her arms around me, and as I have said before, kissed me on both sides without asking my wife's permission. <laughs> and, and I was confused. And she pulled back and she looked at me. She said, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, well, help me, please. You know, we meet a lot of people, Pastor, you know what I mean. And she said, Pastor, I am that woman. I am that woman. She didn't look like that woman. <laughs> One of my favorite miracles, you know, when the Holy Spirit takes hold of you, it'll take care of all kinds of details. It will comb your hair, brush your teeth, put some clean socks on your feet. But that isn't the end of the story. 
when she said that to me, we were both ready to rejoice. And I said, well, why are you attending this meeting? She said, why, I'm a Bible worker. I am the light of the world. You're struggling with darkness, I've got something for you. I am the light of the world. And not only that, I will reveal light and truth. And then you are to come, you know this one, come out of darkness into this. You know, you even got the adverb, the, the adjective, into this marvelous light. That's what God wants. That's what he will do with us. But sometimes he says, the children of darkness are wiser than the children of light. It's not going to go well with those who had great opportunity and didn't do anything. And so, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, I stand up here as an old man now. Oh, I listened to your pastor, Dr. Bird, preach today, and I thought, Lord, isn't this wonderful to hear this kind of message. And, and Walt Pearson, you know, I just rejoice in it. But let me tell you something. The time will come when men will hate light and choose evil. They're doing it now. Get mad at you if you tell them the truth about same sex. They'll, they'll get angry with you if you tell them about wearing certain superfluous adornings. <laughs> Had an opportunity to talk to some of the senior ministerial students since I was been here. And I think in one session I told this story about a person to whom God had brought light and truth. And a church was established. And the people in the Breath of Life Church served faithfully and grew so that in 25 years, they wanted to have a celebration. And they appointed a lady to call me, you must come and be our speaker on the 25th anniversary. Well, we are victims of calendars and my idea has always been, once I put you in the book, you don't come out, unless you request it. If I didn't do that, I would go mad, I believe. So I looked in the calendar and I was assigned to a church over here and I said, my dear, we cannot come. I'm so sorry. If it were on another date, we'd be there. And she said, well, okay, but then they want you to send a video of greetings to them. Ah, I can do that. So I went down to the green room at the general conference, told them what we needed, and then they decided that uh, they would have it ready in a matter of minutes, and I began to talk to that crowd by video. And I said to them, 25 years ago, God gave me the privilege of preaching the truth in your community. And God gave us a brand new church as a result of that. And you are about to celebrate 25 years of progress. I want to tell you this, and I want you to remember what I tell you. The truth that I preached to you 25 years ago is still the truth. We seem to want God to apologize. I, I didn't mean to take it that far. No, you can soften this. And, no, he's not going to do that. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord. I change not. Now that's plain English. Thousands will leave and join the enemy. Other thousands will come in and the ranks of the Lord's army will not be diminished. Now join Peter in jail, bound between guards, midnight, all of a sudden, and by the way, the first thing God does, turn on some light. And the prison house was lighted, and the chains fell off. And Peter was told that the gates likewise are opened. Go on out to the prayer meeting where Rhoda is. And God delivered him in light. In closing, my daddy was a coal miner. 
in those days, you didn't have these electric cars and narrow gauge railroad tracks to haul the coal out. They used mules. Now, they had the tracks, but they pulled the carts with mules. Here's the exciting thing. My daddy said once a week, once a week, those mules had to be loaded on elevators and brought up to the sunshine, else they would go blind. They needed light once a, year, once a week or they would go blind. How on earth do we think we can maintain a clear knowledge of the truth in darkness day after day after day after day? We must keep before the families of the church and the communities where we serve the words of Jesus, the night cometh. The night cometh. Preacher said to me not long ago, he said, Pastor, you folks are obsessed with eschatology. Okay, makes sense. Christ is coming. Nothing ever has happened quite like that will be in all the history of the world. And he's given me information about it and told me to disseminate it. What could be more exciting than that? Walter Ortiz took me into Television City in Hollywood. Went up on the floor where he did business. And there was a man in there who was up out of his seat the minute Ortiz came in and he began to talk. While he's talking, I'm looking around and there's a working board over here on the side of the office. And when I looked over there, every Negro program under the title of entertainment. The only one, I said the only one, yes, that was not listed as entertainment was Breath of Life. It was in the same category with Billy Graham. You ought to say amen to that out there. I like, I like the way Pastor puts it. Somebody say amen. Yeah, so it means verily, I believe it. Verily, I believe it. And the difference between us in the last days will be essentially what we believe and what we don't. I believe that this is the remnant church. No need to try to study with me on it. I've already studied. And I have settled it in my head. I believe that Saturday, the seventh day of the week, is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. I believe that. So if you got to question somebody, find some of these other people. Not me. I believe in the spirit of prophecy. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, I believe in its purpose. And I believe I can trust it. I've tested it. I've thought it through. Try it. And believe. And have faith. The night cometh. The night is almost here. Everything doesn't have to be fun. Everything on television shouldn't be vulgar. You want me to read it? Jeremiah 6, verse 15. Jeremiah said of the women of Israel, they cannot blush. Huh. You think I'm going to run by that? Blushing is a chemical reaction. You're not really supposed to have any control over it. Something offensive comes, something too risque and automatically a chemical reaction starts and your blood flushes the cheeks and you turn red if you can. <laughs> but you can become so used to sin, then bother you. May I tell you something? All the people in Sodom were not Sodomites. Lot had some children there. He went to try to get them. They were not Sodomites. But they thought he was mad when he talked about leaving because of destroying angels. They thought he was crazy. So they were not all into that, but they all died in the same fire with the rest of them. Just think about it. And I'm about to end all of this. It's amazing getting an old preacher started and he doesn't know when to stop. Well, I, I'm going to stop. They tell me in the Arctic 
biologists say in the Arctic, the birds fly faster than they do down south. They are in a hurry because winter's always coming. Winter's always coming. You can't control it. It happens. I want to close. When I shut it like that, it means I'm going to close. <laughs> I want to tell you about a friend. What did I call him? Friend. I've never seen him, but he's one of my close friends. I've never seen him. He's half the world away from me. But on my birthday, he phones. He phones me from a high security prison in Australia. Well, Brooks, how did you get connected? I'll tell you how. We went over to preach in Australia. And there was a family that drove down over 100 miles every night. A whole bunch of them, young people, older, and they would love to stay back and say a few words to you. There was a 17-year-old girl, daughter. Some of you have seen her on 3ABN, didn't know who she was or any connection with me. But she was going to prison ministries and helping prisoners. And she came to this fellow who was considered extremely dangerous and began to talk to him. And for whatever reason, he was willing to listen. And she said to him finally, I have some cassette tapes by a preacher in North America. Would you like to hear them? Well, yes, he snarled. She brought him and he started to listen. His name is Jeff. Jeff D. Cross with a small d. Jeff started listening to those tapes and the Holy Spirit worked on his heart. And the first thing you know, Jeff wants to be baptized. And he got really upset when they wouldn't allow him to go into town to be baptized. So he called me, half a world away. Pastor Brooks, what shall I do? I said, wait, Jeff, if you got baptized in that little church, only that little crowd would know about it. There would be no witness. But if you get baptized in jail, He said, I never thought of that. I said, that's why you called me. <laughs> when Jeff was baptized, there were five other prisoners, won by Jeff and Breath of Life tapes. So one day, prisoners get about 15 or 20 cents an hour, and Jeff was now a trustee, when other prisoners had these terrible problems, they were sent to Jeff for counsel. <laughs> and one day, Jeff got this notion that if I offer to pay my security uh, uh, clearance, they'll let me go into town to see my church, if I could just see my church. And so Jeff prayed and went down to the main warden's office and walked in and, oh, Jeff, what's on your mind? He said, sir, and he told him, I belong to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have never seen my brothers and sisters. I've never seen the church. And I've come to ask you, please let me go just one Sabbath. And I am prepared to pay the fee for an attendant to go with me and bring me back. He said the warden pushed back his chair, opened a drawer, and took out a picture of another convict. And he looked Jeff in the eye and said, do you know who this is? Well, yes, sir. He said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. This guy hurt me and my family, and I want you to take care of him. I want him to disappear. And if you take care of that, I'll let you go into town to your church. Jefferson said, but sir, I can't, I'm, the men know me as, I, don't answer now. Come back tomorrow. Jeff had a restless night. He couldn't figure it. Next morning, his heart was set. He went down and knocked respectfully. And he came in. The warden said, have you made up your mind to take care of this guy? And he started methodically telling the man why he couldn't. Christ has made the difference. There was a time I 
would have done it, but not now. I can't. I can't, sir. He said, get out of my office. Get back to what you were doing and don't ever speak to me about this again. So Jeff went out broken. He said to himself, I I'll go to my work. And when he got there, the head prisoner in charge said, you have no work here, get out of here. What? So he went up to the library, same thing. You got no job here, get out of here. Jeff went to a third place where he had worked a little bit. Same answer. So when he walked outside, it was about to pass through. Another warden said, Jeff, come here. He went over and he had a bucket and a mop and disinfectant. And he said, I want these toilets clean. That's your work. Jeff said to me on the phone, Pastor Brooks, it shocked me and I didn't like it. But once I got started, he said, it was like somebody was in there with me. Yeah. Now, I want to tell you, there was somebody in there with him. He said, the first thing you know, I had a system, and I'm scrubbing these things and scrubbing the floors and washing them down. And I was going at such a pace when time came to knock off. The warden had to send for me. And he said, I went to see him, not the head warden, but another. And he said, it's time to eat. And so when he went to bed that, that night, he went to bed in peace. Next morning, he would go down and start again. He went down and his bucket was there. He went down and his mop was there. He went down and the disinfectant was there. He picked them all up and loaded them in the big bucket. And he started off down the hall to clean toilets. When word came, Jeff, the main warden wants to see you. So he stopped and he left those things there and he went and knocked on the door and he walked in. Sir, I understand you want to see me. Jeff, sit down a minute. You don't have to clean toilets. Go back to the job you enjoyed. This was just a test. Every one of us will be tested as if by fire, says the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please, please, when you say your prayers, pray for me. But at least pray. Darkness will cover the earth. Deep darkness, the people. And men and women will lose sight of the light of God's presence, will not know what to do. And the enemy will march in and march them off in droves of prisonhood. And some who seem to be the brightest lights will lose their way. I simply want to make it. I want to stand. Gentlemen, Walt, I want to be saved. I don't want to do what I did all this time and be lost. You know what it cost me to go to this school? cost me $65 a month. <laughs> now, that's not money unless you have none. <laughs> so I worked on the day raid. 3 a.m. we're on our way. A crew of about 12 men. 7 a.m. you're on your way back. Every day, 24 and 7. And I remember the little story that I got to close on. I was driving right down where it's so beautifully manicured. And uh, somebody said to me, was it like this when you were here? No, that was a wilderness. And that's where the cows slept. <laughs> and I had to go down and wake them up and get them headed toward the barn. The cows seemed to have had a, a political thing and voted that Nancy would be the lead cow. Because if you found Nancy and got her started, all the others just trailed along the time. <laughs> One night I heard a scream coming out of the bushes. They talked about these wildcats. And I hurried up and found Nancy. But I was deep in the middle of that herd 
comforted by the fact that if anything is capable of killing and eating, they're going to have enough beef before they get to me. <laughs> I have good memories, but I want to be saved. How many of you want to be saved? Raise your hand. Oh, yes, sir. We can be, and we can meet on the sea of glass. And there will be time for one-on-one -on -one with Jesus because the Spirit of Prophecy said so. He's going to take us for a walk beside the crystal stream and there explain to us all the dark providences through which he led us in order to develop our characters. I want to be there. I want to see you there. By the grace of God, would you stand with me for prayer? Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you that the doors are still open. Thank you that men and women who want to be saved may be saved. Eyes are closed and shut. And those of us who do evangelism do it humbly. Souls are not won by men, they're won by the Holy Ghost. And if you're not willing to resist, the Lord will save somebody right here tonight. If you are one of those and you want to be a child of light serving the Lord when he ends this mess and you're not on safe ground, we invite you to come forward at this time. Indicate that you want to be on the Lord's side. Is there anyone here like that? Like that? And I'm so grateful for these choirs today the young people who didn't go to the basketball game but came here. Thank God for you. Pray earnestly, folks. And let's go home when he comes. You may be seated. I'm going to sit here. Is that all right? And what a privilege it was to listen to him preach like that.